They're all pieces of the puzzle for innovative solutions to a community problem from the detectives trying to make the busts. My squad specifically um, goes after the people who are selling this poison on the street. To the laws targeting the dealers who get users high. If you stop the supply, you stop the problem. To the researchers on the front lines advocating for a positive outlet. Also, how do we cope with stress in a healthy and productive way? Tonight on 10 Tampa Bay This Evening, 10 Investigates Overdosed. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carolina Lee. And I'm Dave Wagner. Tonight we are turning over the studio to our 10 Investigates team as new data out today shows a record number of drug overdose deaths. Over the next two nights, Jennifer Titus, Emerald Morrow, Jenna Bourne, and Liz Crawford are giving you a look at the impact fentanyl addiction is having on our community. Chances are you know someone who is taking fentanyl. The spike in overdose deaths from synthetic opioids, mostly fentanyl, increased more than 56% from 2019 to 2020. Adults ages 35 to 44 are one of the groups most likely to use. They saw the highest increase at more than 30%, and it's men who are most likely to overdose. So who's tackling the problem? 10 Tampa Bay's Liz Crawford talked to Hillsborough County's overdose squad. Their special investigators say drugs are killing people at a rate they've never seen before. Well, you might already know that we have an overdose crisis in Florida. But I wanted to know the specifics. What exactly is the problem? And why is it worse now than it's ever been? Sir! Everyone has their own story. Capital Nine Baker, can you start medical? No one wakes up and says, you know what, I'm going to use heroin, I'm going to use fentanyl today. For some, it's rooted in mental illness. Others say it started with recreational use as a teen. For many, it was legitimate pain leading to prescription painkillers. They'll tell me that it's the best feeling they've ever felt in their life. It makes them euphoric. It makes, it, it completely takes their pain away. It takes their depression away. It takes all these things away. Before you know it, you're chasing euphoria and the goalposts keep changing. Once you start building a tolerance to any of these types of things, now that feeling that you once had is not as strong as it was before. So the only way that you can get that experience again is to take more until you take too much and you find yourself here what did she take overdosed and on the verge of death hey think it's a wake-up call not usually hope i did the right thing why are you buying you know this stuff that's making you overdose and they say well that's the best stuff on the street hey Overdoses also happen because people didn't know the drug they bought was laced with something else, something stronger and more potent. You may think that you're taking one thing and then it could be a de deadly poison of something else. Like you think it's an Adderall and it's something else. Could be fentanyl. Come on, come on boss. That's partly why law enforcement is going after the dealers. A lot of these dealers, they don't even use the stuff. They're literally, it's just a business for them and the more potent stuff that they have than the more customers that they get. Their work is undercover and time consuming. This crisis, it may be huge, but it's worth the fight. There you go, there you go. You just relax. I had to do two. According to Live Tampa Bay, the overdose rate in our area is 10% higher than the state and 50% higher than the nation. Nearly three people die every day in the Tampa Bay area from an overdose. The DEA is warning there has been a spike in mass overdoses over spring break. Two months ago in South Florida, six people overdosed on cocaine that turned out to contain fentanyl too. Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue says they were West Point cadets on vacation. Four people went into cardiac arrest and two others were exposed when they tried to give CPR. Throughout the newscast, we want to offer you resources for getting the help that you or someone you know might need. We've put them together for you on our website. Just text this number, 727-577-8522, with the word overdose, and we'll send you a link directly to your phone. While fatal drug overdoses continue to rise, there's a law in the state of Florida that allows prosecutors to charge those who dealt the drugs with murder. But as I uncovered, the numbers of those charged are quite low compared to the increase in deaths. This is Katie's room. We have um, 
all her trophies, all her uh, cheerleading hair bows. Dawn Golden says it's these memories that help her get through. This is the, her urn with her ashes. The fact that Katie is no longer here. You miss her every day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Katie Golden passed away from a drug overdose. That was um, five years ago, April 1st. It was her senior prom, and that was the last photo we took. The man police officers say sold the drugs that killed Katie? This man, Garland Layton, he is facing a first-degree murder charge for distributing heroin that caused death. When I look at the crisis that this country is facing, mm -hmm. I'm glad that we have this specific tool in our toolkit. That tool is Florida's death by distribution law. Put in place during the war on drugs in the 80s, people who deal certain drugs that cause death can be charged for their murder. In 2017, Governor Scott signed into law for fentanyl to be added to the law. So we're aggressively prosecuting the dealers and the suppliers who sell this poison into our, into our community. But even so, as the opioid crisis wrecks havoc on the state, many state's attorneys across the state have only used this charge a handful of times since 2017. Hillsborough County State Attorney Andrew Warren has used it nine times. He says that's the most in the state. Is that number too low? Well, again, I mean, the... The number's low relative to the number of overdose deaths. Mm -hmm. I think we can all agree there's a difference between two friends who are sharing drugs and one of them overdoses versus the Pablo Escobar who is profiting by dumping drugs into our community in terms of which case should be prosecuted. Yeah. These cases are really hard for law enforcement to even start an investigation, much less come to a prosecutor to finish that prosecution. There's often no witnesses. People are using drugs and they die often by themselves. There is often no paper trail. There are not receipts and clear records of where the drugs came from. You stop the supply, you stop the problem. The people are selling poison and it's killing people and they know it, they don't care. If you don't prosecute them, they're just going to keep keep handing out poison to our kids. Don Golden says she hopes more people are charged with this law. And justice will be served for those dealing deadly drugs. We've lost Katie or there's nothing else that can hurt us any worse. So, so getting her justice is um, you know, it's what, what we can do to make a difference, to make her life matter. Fentanyl has been around since the 1960s as a pharmaceutical drug, but street use started to increase nearly a decade ago, especially in the Northeast. Then it spread to other parts of the country, including Florida. In 2016, Prince died of an accidental overdose at his home in Minnesota. The 57-year-old started taking the painkillers to cope with some tort injuries before he became addicted. While some are prescribed the powerful drug, others are finding it rather easy to come by on the street. So how is it circulating? DEA Special Agent Mike Ferguson shared this sharper insight that is predominantly shipped to the Bay Area in packages originating from Mexico. There's pure anonymity behind sending it through the mail. Uh, the recipient may be a fake name and as well as the sender may be a fake name. The chemicals are derived from China, shipped into Mexico, where the laboratories are then producing what we see as straight fentanyl powder and or a lot of what we're starting to see are pressed pills. He says the drugs, which look like popular prescriptions, are easily distributed between here and Orlando. From heroin to fentanyl, opioids have been separating families across the Tampa Bay area for years. There are 22,000 kids in the foster system here in Florida. And substance abuse is the number one reason why kids are removed from their homes and put in foster care, according to the National Youth Advocacy Program. That organization works with the Safe Children Coalition in Sarasota to provide foster homes to kids whose parents are in crisis. We have the trauma from them being in a home environment that's not safe, whether it be abuse or neglect, and they have trauma from that. Then we deal with removing that child from their parents, from their family, 
there's trauma that comes with that. And then we face the trauma of kids coming into care, possibly being separated from their siblings, being put in a shelter for a week, then going to another placement for a foster home for another week, and moving around the area. I mean, it's just intensifies that trauma that they're already dealing with. Hernandez says exploring whether you would make a good fit to open your home to a child in need starts with a conversation with other foster parents or advocates about what it's like to foster kids. When it comes to drug use, addiction does not discriminate, but the factors leading to it can. And new research shows deadly drug overdoses are rising fastest among black Americans and the pandemic made it worse. To find out the impact in our own community, we followed two leaders in our area on the front lines of fighting fentanyl. The leading scientist in the world on this issue have tied a direct line from systemic racism to fentanyl in the black community. God, our communities have been destroyed and harmed by dangerous drugs. Outside St. Pete's Woodson African American Museum. Opioid and fentanyl have worked their ways into our communities. An unlikely scene. Lift up the head and the spirit of those who are fighting an addiction. Prayers to fight fentanyl. I think it's very easy, to be honest with you, to focus on communion, weddings, funerals, a Sunday school, and not deal with tragedy of homeless being broken because of drugs. The Reverend J.C. Pritchett works with community groups on solutions. He says drugs have been a taboo topic in the church for way too long. And it's going to take more than prayers to solve this crisis. We can't pretend that it doesn't exist because it does. And it's impacting black Floridians in numbers growing faster than any other group. According to Live Tampa Bay, the opioid overdose death rate for black Floridians increased 330% from 2014 to 2018. How this uh, crisis affects our communities is different than another community. And so several things happened with the global pandemic. We weren't gathering on a regular basis as we do in our, our tradition at worship on Sundays. That's a support system several times a week that literally was removed from our community. When you are hurt, you're looking for an answer. You're looking for a salve, a solution to feel better. And, and, and again, a black uh, answer for a black problem, that since 1619, the black body has been uh, attacked, it's been, um, discriminated against, it's had to deal with different uh, aspects of being a person of color in this country. I started out first drinking and then uh, marijuana and then by 11 I, I was sniffing heroin. Fentanyl isn't the first opioid crisis to hit the black community. I tend to do more or less, more or less uh, for a false sense of enjoyment, a false sense of fulfillment, to kind of like be able to deal with my, my feelings of worthlessness. Uh, inside. USF researcher Dr. Micah Johnson studies drug misuse. He says the heroin epidemic of the 70s and 80s should be a lesson for today. The face of the opioid crisis at that time was poor black people. Therefore, it was met with a lot of insensitivity, no resources, no humanization, and locking people up and treating them like animals. A disparity Johnson hopes to better address this time around. Well, we're heading down to one of the best facilities in our college. Over 2,000 square feet research laboratory, the largest cluster of African American researchers in the country, probably. Gifted through a $1.5 million grant from NIH. In this new space. How do the drugs get into these communities? USF researchers will study the impact fentanyl and other drug use is having on minority communities. We don't quite understand the impact it's having because we haven't been able to do the research fast enough to keep up with the epidemic. Neither has the state. The Florida Department of Health tracks a lot of drug data, but we couldn't find any racial breakdowns for fentanyl. We've been worried about disparities. State Senator Daryl Rusan once had his own battle with drugs. And he's behind a new law that requires each county to create health equity plans. The first thing we need to do is track the data. He says tracking fentanyl in black communities should be a priority. Nothing is more urgent than losing lives to fentanyl and to other types of drug overdoses. Throughout the history of time, drugs have been considered medicines, right? So why are people overindulging in certain substances and certain medicines? One paradigm is that 
it's, it's to cope. Dr. Johnson says fentanyl is especially harmful in low-income black communities that formed as the result of racial segregation. He says the street supply is getting more dangerous. The fentanyl is so powerful that it's used to, to, to cut and mix with other drugs to maintain a certain potency. Johnson says the drugs are some people's way of dealing with life's pressures when they don't have the tools or resources to cope. Folks who are hopeless are four to eight times more likely to misuse opioids. I've heard folks mention the, the widespread availability of drugs, but the lack of healthcare services, not just therapy, but any sort of healthcare services in their communities, and that's a huge problem. Systemic racism is a critical issue, a critical barrier by which people feel stress, and also that blocks people from access. So to find a solution. We have to address the social stressors that are causing people to need to cope. That thing called hope. You the creator of everything. Is so important. Offer hope. For those who feel hopeless, they, they turn to these drugs to, to escape that hopelessness. The people you saw in this piece, they're working to make sure that people can have that hope and that research center at USF. Dr. Johnson says it is one of, if not the largest in the nation, studying addiction when it comes to drug use in communities of color. We're gonna be back tomorrow at six, focusing on the innovative and even controversial solutions to helping people stay alive long enough to get into recovery. In the meantime, groups like the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay and Families Against Fentanyl can put you in touch with someone who can help. That includes the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration 24-7 hotline. It's free and confidential. We've put all of these together for you on our website. Just text this number, 727-577-8522, with the word overdose, and we'll send you a link directly to your phone.